Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here this Thursday evening, live from the SEC studios in White Bear Lake. If you're watching any other time than January 16th, uh, it's not live. This is a call-in show, so we do welcome uh, comments and questions. Uh, so, but if it's not the 16th, you can't call in. Uh, but to call in, 651-747-3838. And uh, if you don't want to call in or you're watching us on a replay and you have comments or questions, uh, look at speechlessmn at gmail.com and you can send me a message, comments, suggestions on the show. And uh, I'd be glad to hear from you. And I appreciate all the comments I do get, uh, uh, good or bad. Uh, I, I can take constructive criticism. Uh, I, everybody needs constructive criticism, so no, no big deal. Uh, also, if you want to see this show or some of the past shows, you can go to youtube.com speechless mn or backslash speechless mn uh, or Google Tim Kinley and speechless and it will get you there faster uh, because Lady Gaga videos come up and then you got to go, do you mean speechless and men? So, uh, weird, weird deal. Uh, anyway, a uh, lot of information on the show today, a lot happening. Uh, the Minnesota Supreme Court upheld a tax judge, George Perez, upheld him being disciplined, but not as hard as the Board on Judicial Standards wanted him disciplined or the three court, a three, uh, three panel uh, appeals court uh, on this case. Uh, so we're going to discuss that a little bit. Uh, Dakota County District Court Judge Metzen, retired Judge Metzen, who's deciding a case uh, over uh, criminal allegations of misconduct uh, against attorney Michelle McDonald has refused me from filming in the courtroom. Uh, I got a letter on that, I'll explain that. Also the Divorce Corp movie, C-O-R-P movie, uh, has been showing. Today is the last night in the theaters. Uh, so if you want to get the, I believe it's the 940 showing, that's the last one, so you can watch my show. Head over to Invergrove Heights and uh, watch the movie, fantastic. Got some updates on that. Um, but the rest of the show, we're going to be talking about the federal case that took place Friday at uh, Federal District Court before the Honorable Susan uh, Nelson, who uh, the case was about uh, a lawsuit against Dakota County District Court Judge um, David Knutson for violating uh, civil rights of a person that was before Judge Knutson. And so we have a lot of film and comments about why this lawsuit is being taken place, why against a judge, can it be done against a judge, why should it be done against a judge, and uh, just some of the unique aspects of this case that are, that are important for our liberties and for transparency and cleaning up our, the Minnesota judiciary, which in my opinion, uh, is not behaving well, uh, misbehaving, uh, misdemeanors <laughs> um, would be another, another category uh, of, of why they behave badly. So uh, before we get into all that, just want a couple updates here. Next week, January 22nd, is the March for Life, MCCL, Minnesota's Concern uh, Minnesota Citizens Concern for Life is having a rally at the cap Capitol, pro-life rally, uh, at 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock, and you want to be there. If you want to see abortion end in Minnesota, it's very important to be at this rally and to send a message that this is not acceptable. And uh, if you don't go, you're sending an opposite message. And we need a lot of people down there. We, you know, we need about 100,000 people down there to send a message. And 6,000 isn't going to do it. 10,000 isn't going to do it. We need a lot more than that. And, uh, you know, we need to act like men, stand in the gaps, step up, get down there, and uh, 
show, uh, express our opinions and show our force and uh, pray for our Minnesota. Um, so that's March, or excuse me, January 22nd down at the Capitol, the front of the Capitol. Also, February 4th, there's precinct caucuses that start somewhere, that start at 7 o'clock, but usually most of them have uh, pre-caucus warm-ups at 6.30. So you might want to go contact the Secretary of State's office to find out where your precinct caucus is at. Uh, and uh, they'd be more than happy to help you out there. So uh, I have been trying to film in district court in Minnesota and at federal court, federal district court or the appellate courts. Both of these places don't allow, well the federal courts don't allow any cameras in the courtroom whatsoever. Uh, it's, a, it's a tragedy, uh, unbelievable that our judiciary disrespects our Constitution and nobody's trying to hold them accountable. But I've sent letters to Minnesota District Court, Judge Leslie Metzen, a retired uh, judge who was sitting on a case, wanting to film this particular issues of Michelle McDonald and some cases she's involved with because judges are misbehaving. And the rules, the rules, not the Constitution, of the state of Minnesota, the United States, but the rules of the judiciary are, if you want to film in district court, you have to have all three parties, the judge, the plaintiff, and the respondent, uh, attorney's permission. And then you got to give 10 days notice. Now, an attorney can object, but the judge can overrule that objection, which means it's all on the judge's hands. If the judge wants it filmed, it's filmed, okay? There's just no question about it. So um, Judge Leslie Met Metzen in the letter stated to me, you've already requested before, and however, I did request before, but that was on a different day. I'm requesting for a, a separate day, a, a totally different day, and you gotta request for each one. And But in this case, I requested for all Michelle McDonald's issues and her client's issue, there's actually two cases that I want to film on. And she said, since an attorney objective, which was the county prosecutor objected, huh, there's another governor official denying freedom of the press. The judge said, since they objective, I'm objecting. Uh, I will not let you film. So my media is obviously film, and in order to show you what's taking place, I need film. And it's a denial of the press and this medium of, of press. I can go in there and I can write down. I'm not good at writing down. I'm not good at writing. <laughs> and so media is my best avenue, and things get explained better through the media and they're denying it. It's a big, big problem. Uh, but anyway, that letter came back, but there in that letter, Liz the ground works for a lawsuit and one will be filed here eventually suing the judge because it goes to the case that we're talking about. Judges do not have the, the authority to deny constitutional rights and liberties. And they can be sued in their person for denying these constitutional rights. So that avenue will be pursued uh, as just well as a, a suit to say, hey, let me in, let me film. Um, there was a movie that's showing, Divorce Corp. And I went to the movie last Sunday night. A uh, number of people were there. Actually, the press was there. Um, I think the name is Gail Rosen. Bloom or Rosenbaum, uh, Star Tribune wrote an article. I thought it was what I would expect. It was actually pretty good. And uh, I think it accurately uh, showed how divorce courts work, how our uh, marriage dissolution system works in the United States. It's very generic, but I think it applied to all the states. The states I'm familiar with, it applied. 
And for that amount of time, if you want to get a proper understanding of what happens in the courts, what you're up against, you need to watch this movie. And the people who need to watch this movie are specifically legislators and attorneys and pastors and anybody considering a divorce. They need to see so they can be prepared to understand what's going on so they don't think people are crazy. The biggest criticism, and I, I expected that this would happen, is that people would come out and say, it's extreme examples. And the answer to that is, no, it's not. It's not extreme. This is the reality that takes place in our courts and in our courtrooms. It happens all the time, but people just don't believe that it happens. So when they document some uh, bad behavior by judges and it's documented, people are going to say, well, pff, extreme behavior, you know. Uh, but everybody that was in the room that had experienced the court system agreed that it wasn't extreme. Now, some, there was a question and answer time after the movie, and some of these uh, people in attorneys and uh, people in mediation felt it was a little extreme, but, or at least one of them did, but they're not in the courtroom as much. They give their testimony and leave, don't necessarily see the results. Uh, so they wanted to play that down a little bit, um, which is their opinion, uh, but I, I would disagree with them. The other thing about the movie, it talked about the bad actors and the judges, the attorneys, the guardian ad litems, court administrators, uh, all these bad actors uh, involved in the process and misbehaving going on. What it did neglect is the people getting divorced. Okay, because people getting divorced, there can be and most likely is a bad actor in that situation. And to ignore that, I don't, I can't say they ignored it, but it was not talked about extensively uh, in the film as other areas of the divorce industry are, uh, were talked about. Um, but I would go watch it. You, if you got a son or a daughter thinking of getting married, they need to watch this. It's serious, serious business. But very good movie, very well done. I thought it very accurately described processes and procedure and what takes place uh, in a divorce and in the court system. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Minnesota Supreme Court came out, uh, I believe, on the 14th. Could have been the 15th. Um, that, uh, that said tax court judge Perez should be punished, uh, but not to the extent that the board on judicial standards thought he should be punished. And the board thought he should be removed for nine months and then, um, and then he can go back, uh, but with some censure too. The Supreme Court said, no, just censor him. He shouldn't be removed from office. But in the meantime, uh, this position is different than a normal judge because a normal judge is under the judicial branch, a separate branch of our government, but one of the three branches. But the judges for tax court are part of the executive branch, which is a problem in itself because you get that judge being appointed as a governor, and so you're under the governor as part of the executive branch. If you don't do what the governor says, the next time around for appointments and they get reappointed, the governor can say, well, I, I don't accept you. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to reappoint you. In this case, Governor Dayton went and said, I've appointed him. Now I'm asking you senators, because he did, uh, re he reappointed Judge Perez. Governor Dayton asked the senators to not accept the appointment. So we're going to play the clip here of uh, uh, the first one here of uh, Ortman uh, making a summary of what had taken place prior to the Senate getting the bill. So let's watch this clip.
had issues before the board on judicial standards. And when he came to speak with Senator Limmer and myself two years ago seeking confirmation from this body, we were aware of very serious allegations against Judge Perez. And so we decided to wait on confirmation until the Board on Judicial Standards had had an opportunity to review the allegations against Judge Perez. And very recently, in the last few days, the Board on Judicial Standards has uh, given an opinion and made findings of fact and a recommendation to the Minnesota Supreme Court. The recommendations of the uh, Board on Judicial Standards is that Judge Perez should be uh, suspended for nine months and demoted as chief judge. All right, so the recommendation was to be uh, suspended for nine months and demoted as chief judge. Uh, and, uh, but what did he do? You know, why, why would that take place? What was his offense that was so offensive? Well, Senator Oatman uh, then goes into the allegations of what he, what he was accused of. So let's, let's hear the, the allegations. It's a very strong recommendation from the Board on Judicial Standards because what they found in their findings of fact is that Judge Perez delayed over and over and over again in making decisions on the tax court, decisions he had responsibility to make. But worse than the delay, Judge Perez violated Minnesota statutes by certifying that his decisions were being made timely when they were not. And the Board on Judicial Standards found that he falsified court records in doing that, and they found that he did it knowingly. And Madam President and members, that is a very grave violation because our taxpayers and Minnesotans across the state are expecting our judges to be fair and to honor the law. And we should expect them to follow the statutes that show some kind of accountability for the decisions that they make. So this happened back in uh, May of 2013. And uh, the, you know, what was interesting to me is I had very, very good information that a lot worse things were happening uh, by this judge and other judges that they were actually uh, sending letters to workers there to hide the fact that they were being late on their orders, okay, on, on their decisions. They were going past the 90 days. Now, we uh, had a guest on my show um, that uh, I met at the uh, appeals panel for Judge Perez and brought him on. He had to wait 18 months for a decision by the uh, tax court Judge Perez. Uh, that's atrocious. That's at the basically the district court level. And, um, y you know, that, that just stops your life for that period of time. Yet an order was to come out in 90 days and it didn't happen. Uh, and again, this is a different system because it's in the executive branch than in the judicial branch. So all of a sudden now we're coming with conflicts. Why does the Senate get to uh, approve or reject an, a, nomina a nomination for a judge when that doesn't happen on the executive side, when it doesn't happen on the judicial side? In federal court, the Senate approves or rejects a judge, confirms uh, the appointment, but not in Minnesota, it's just the governor appoints. So there's one less check and balance on our judicial side, but since we have a judge on the executive side, which is, in my book, a big conflict of interest, there should be no judges on the executive side. It should be all on the judicial side. Um, so this, this conflict of interest, uh, this lack of confirmation, uh, then Judge Perez was then out of a job from the legislative and ex executive side of the books. But there's still the judicial discipline side going on here, okay, by the Board on Judicial Standards. Well, that's a question that came up. Does the Board have jurisdiction in this case? Because he's, he's with the executive side, not the judicial side. And so a whole lot of issues were going on there. 
It was convoluted, but not to an extent that Judge Perez could not and should not deal with his, uh, shouldn't, his problem shouldn't have been dealt with. Well, <clears throat> the Supreme Court came out and said, the discipline that was handed down was too harsh. He should still be a judge, but he should be censured, which, which is a slap on the wrist. Uh, censured basically means um, he's just got to be a judge, really can't go out and do any other extra activity. He needs to get his act together and make sure his cases get done. And Judge Perez was going, well, since I was notified that I was doing things wrong, I haven't been doing things wrong, therefore you shouldn't do anything. In my opinion, he should be off the bench. But the whole question on the Supreme Court turned into, Supreme Court, what jurisdiction and why are you doing anything at all because I'm out of office. I didn't get reappointed. I'm not a judge anymore. So why are you doing anything? Well, uh, the issue was up that because he misbehaved, his license is at stake. And he's also licensed in Wisconsin. So Minnesota had to go by court order now by the Supreme Court, goes and tells Wisconsin that, hey, Judge Perez misbehaved. He's got an attorney's license over there. So you need to do what you need to do. You can do nothing, you can do something. But the same is going on over here in Minnesota where Judge Perez's license is being reviewed as an attorney as to whether he can still practice law. So the good news, this judge was a bad actor, was not, in my opinion, doing what he needed to do uh, as a judge and uh, made people suffer quite a bit. Uh, but I want to explain here that this really, and why I think the Supreme Court did not issue a more harsh judgment than the Board on Judicial Standards and the Appellate Review Board, and why um, they gave them a less sentence or less discipline, is because the Minnesota Supreme Court itself has a number of cases that are over 90 days, although the Minnesota Supreme Court doesn't have a timeline. But I know a case, the Bergstrom case, we've talked about it on our show uh, regarding a constitutional challenge on 50-year restraining orders. It's been over 13 months and it's silence. There's no answer going on on that case. And in the meantime, this man is sitting without any allegations of abuse against his children. And it's been another 13 months that he's been able to see his kids. I mean, and I said another 13 months. There's a couple, two or three years piled onto that also uh, from prior. And this man, and also it's happening in federal court because he had a case in federal court four or five five months ago where he was suing uh, Woodbury police because he was put and arrested and put in jail for violating an OFP, which he wasn't doing. And the police did not notify, or the city attorney did not notify the prosecutor, the county prosecutor, that he was there. He sat there for 56 days without charges. You can only be held for 48 hours without charges, 56 days. And so he sued in federal court, and federal court is not giving an answer to his case. There's, there's little more details going on there, but on this issue, federal court is not answering. And so what is going on with our courts? They need to be exposed. They need to be held accountable. We need to have transparency in our court system. and. Uh, people need to know what's going on, and this is one of the only places you're going to get it. Uh, so, anyway, that's kind of the update on Judge Perez. Oh, we got one more video. Uh, there was, I want, to, want you to see uh, Senator Marty's uh, explanation and then the vote total uh, on Judge Perez not being confirmed. Madam President, I want to second what Senator Ortman has said and thank the Tax Committee for handling this so quickly yesterday. Again, if we don't do action on this um, and the Supreme Court upholds the 
follow suit on the findings, the judge would not be able to serve at all for nine months, and after that he would be banned as being chief judge because there only are three judges on the tax court. I don't think we want to have this vacancy. I think it's time for the Senate to act, and the governor's letter spells out very clearly why it's important that we do so. So I want to second what Senator Ortman and Senator Scoy have been saying and urge all members to reject the confirmation. All members having voted that desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being zero ayes and 57 nays, the confirmation is not confirmed. So Judge Perez was not confirmed, and you, you saw the vote there. Um, I had a point, but forgot it. <laughs> forgot what it was. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, judge, the part of the explanation was the, the board said he should not be on the bench for nine months. Well, we only got three judges on this tax uh, court, and so they'd be down a third, and they got a huge caseload. So now, with this d number being down, we just need to reappoint somebody else and get the judge out of the way. Now the Supreme Court comes out six months later, basically, and says, ah, you know, you should have never... Um, had a penalty of being removed for nine months and yet so you, you just that whole thing when, when uh, the final decision was opposite of what they thought it was going to be but because of what they thought it was going to be he got removed uh, and not confirmed for that seat. Okay let's go on to the big story today that's the federal court case against uh, District Court Judge David Knudsen out of Dakota County. And it is a civil rights action for actions that David Knudsen committed uh, against Sandra Grazini Rucky and all the laws that he violated and thus and violating her constitutional rights by taking property and children away from her without due process and without following the rules of law. And so there was a uh, press conference, basically, down at the federal court office. Again, I tried to film the court case. I tried to have the press conference inside the federal building. Uh, they wouldn't let me do it. It was freezing out there. Everybody had to come and do it outside. But uh, just to give you a little flavor, uh, the first speaker there was Leah Danowitz, uh, otherwise known as uh, Leah Bankin, who's been on my show, but she kind of gives a kind of a summary of the problems with the court. So let's hear what she has to say prior to the case. My name is Leah Danowitz. I am a mother of three beautiful children in Carver County, Minnesota. I have a daughter that's nine, a son that's seven, and a little baby girl that's three. Um, I haven't seen my kids in two and a half years. They were taken away by a judge in Carver County. Um, I started a blog called Carver County Corruption, which has gained quite a bit of popularity. And, you know, we're, we're here today to, for a federal, federal court hearing um, to see if a judge can be sued personally, since judges are immune. And it's, just, it's another cry for help in our state. There are so many cases like mine. Uh, the blog that I started, Carver County Corruption, was ordered off the internet. The judge court ordered the blog down. I refused to take it down because my kids are in jeopardy. They don't have a mother. And, uh, you know, when it, we, we have issues in this state, we have to go back to the Minnesota Constitution. And you, that's really what you need to rely on. And the Constitution says in Article 6, Section 9, that the legislative branch is to oversee our judicial branch. It's for a very good reason. And we gave that up back in 1979. The judicial branch was allowed to go off by itself and start what we call a board of judicial standards. And um, that is actually overseen by the judges. So you have the fox watching the hen house. Today we're in here, um, a judge uh, is being sued. We're trying to see if we can sue, uh, one of the mothers is trying to sue a judge that literally in his own courtroom told her to go ahead and file a complaint with him against, against him with the Board of Judicial Standards because he is actually on the Board of Judicial Standards. He taunted her with it. We don't have any judicial accountability in this state. Um, and, you know, when we do have a lot of very good judges, there are some that are, of course, abusing their authority and their power. 
And when you have no accountability for judges and ultimate power over citizens, of course, that's what's going to happen eventually. Um, so judicial accountability is a very big issue in this state. Yeah, it, it is, and it will be a big issue at the legislature um, this year. Of course, there's that attempt to try to take away accountability from the judiciaries by only have judges appointed where the people won't get to vote for judges anymore. And it's the last form of check and balances that we have on the judiciary right now, and that's trying to be taken away. And so there'll be quite a bit of an effort to stop that. There was uh, quite a few people that made comments uh, about the case, and I just have to cut it back because we just got an hour show here, <laughs> so um, picked out some of the some of the comments. Uh, but I wanted to hear what uh, Attorney Michelle McDonald had to say about the case before she went in, and then when she came out. So uh, I want to play Mac Fed one uh, next, and uh, um, hear some of her comments about the case. Uh, uh, today. It marks uh, a day of uh, family innocence, family civil liberties, civil rights. It's a very important decision uh, that the Honorable Susan Richard Nelson will make after today. Um, it's uh, a decision for all families, not just for Sandra and her five children. Um, that this case go forward. I believe we will be successful for Sandra Grazini Rocky and her five children and all families. You know, um, so that was just kind of the flavor of the seriousness of it. <clears throat> there was about uh, 43 people in the courtroom, from my count. 40 were on uh, Sandra's side. That was Sandra. Grazini Rucky standing next to uh, attorney Michelle McDonald. And what was interesting is Sandra's uh, ex-husband was there and ex-husband's attorney was there. Uh, I think it's Lisa Elliott. And they were giving the attorney general of the state of Minnesota information, but David Knutson, the judge, wasn't there. And this was about David Knutson, the judge and his capacity. And of course, the Attorney General was defending David Knutson. So why was David Ruckey there and David Ruckey's attorney giving information to uh, the Attorney General, uh, uh, Attorney General's attorney uh, representing uh, Judge Knutson? Uh, just a little, little strange <laughs> what was going on there. Okay, uh, but this was a, called a federal 1983 uh, civil class action lawsuit, and we're going to get a little explanation of what that is. So let's play the next clip. A 1983 action is a civil rights action. And it, the elements are when somebody violates civil rights under color of law. And color of law is if you're wearing a robe or a policeman's uniform, um, you, you, it looks like, you know, I, I like to say, it looks like a duck, flies like a duck, quacks like a duck, but it isn't a duck. Uh, so that's what this case is all about. It's civil rights individually against defendant David Knudsen, not in his capacity as a judge. You know, it's interesting that, I mean, people know this, and we hear about it all the time. Police officers beating up on citizens, overly beating up on citizens. Uh, they get sued, makes national news, uh, police officers killing people. Uh, you know, they can't they can kill people in the right situations, but they can't in the wrong situations. They have no right to do that. And when that happens, uh, they are to be held accountable. And we see and we hear about them being ac held accountable. But it isn't any different for the police officer than it is for the judge by law. It is different for the judge. The judge protects themselves. 
and they don't have the right to do that. And that, that's an interesting item that was being played out in this case. A judge has no right, just because they have the robe on there, to violate somebody's constitution or civil rights. So when justice, or, or not justice, but Judge Susan Smith, in my case, told me I couldn't teach my kids the Bible and took them away because of that, she violated my constitutional right. She has no right to do that. Okay. Uh, can, can, can a judge take away life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? Can they do that? Well, no, they can't. They have no authority. They have no right to do that. Uh, but yet, they do. Uh, and then they have to follow proper procedures in order to do that. A person would have to be found guilty of something in order for that to take place. And when procedures, various procedures, and we'll talk about those in a bit, didn't take place, this is what we see happens. So let's play, uh, do judges just get blanket immunity? Let's see what Michelle McDonald has to say. Immunity is, it means that judges and, and members of our government can uh, m take action, make mistakes, and, and be immune from those mistakes. However, I brought this case because judges should not be immune from violating civil and constitutional rights. That's because they're sworn to uphold our civil and constitutional rights. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, and that's where they, the judge should get in trouble. Uh, they should not have this jurisdiction uh, or immunity. But let's look at the, one of the issues here in this case was a judge's jurisdiction. If a, did the judge have jurisdiction to do what he did? And if he took jurisdiction in a proper way, then he, in an improper way, then he has no jurisdiction. So let's see what Michelle McDonald says about jurisdiction in this case. Oh, it's not up there? Okay. All right, my bad. Well, um, basically, Judge Knudsen, well, we're going to find another clip on this. So uh, let's go to uh, federal prayer. Now, what happened after the press conference, uh, a bunch of people gathered. Let's just run the video. I'll, we'll talk over it. Uh, gathered, and that's a live video. They're praying on the federal courthouse steps. Um, and now, every one of them should have been warned that by praying, they could have the possibility of their kids being taken away, but most of these people have already had their kids taken away. <laughs> so I don't know that it would have been a, a, a real big factor as to whether they prayed there or not. Um, so outside the courtroom, you can have prayer. Of course, inside the courtroom, they open the courtroom in the federal court cases of saying, God save the, the court and God save the United States uh, of America. Uh, they invoke God's name over the proceedings uh, in federal court. It's actually fascinating. Just the opening is fascinating of these federal district courts. All right, so let's go to after uh, the hearing and uh, hear what uh, Del Nathan had to say about uh, his comments of the hearing that took place. Of course, we. What I just saw is evidence that judges can and do anything they want. Michelle McDonald illustrated the terrible things that Judge Knutson has done and the court is being asked by the Attorney General of Minnesota to let him get away with it because judges are immune. They are immune from any consequence for anything that they do, even hurting five kids, including two teenage girls that today are on the run. They are not going to school. They have no supervision because judges don't really care what they do as long as they can get away with it. So hopefully this illustrates the 
big, big need for legislative oversight that I hope the legislature will com uh, consider this year. Yeah, so uh, Dale got a few other issues about judicial oversight in there. Um, it was interesting, the, the big thing that, here was the argument that the Attorney General's office was making about Judge David Knudsen. They made basically three arguments. First argument was, David Knudsen is a judge, he has immunity. Second argument was, David Knudsen is a judge, he has immunity. The third argument was, David Knudsen is a judge, he has immunity. It, doesn't, it didn't matter what his actions were and what he did. As long as he was acting in his official capacity as a judge, it didn't matter. So anything in that courtroom that he did or made a decision on, that's in his official capacity, therefore he has immunity. And no, that is not true. You can act as a judge in your official capacity, but if you violate somebody's constitutional rights and civil rights, you don't have immunity. As a judge in that courtroom, you cannot stand up and say, uh, plaintiff or respondent, uh, you're both guilty. I'm going to kill you both right now. Take out a gun and shoot you. He does not have that right. The same thing is if... Um, If the judge goes and says, you know what, we're not having a hearing on this, I'm deciding this on my own, You're gonna, I'm going to take kids away from you and you have no recourse, uh, they're just gone, it's a temporary order but it's going to last a long time, it's the same thing. The parental rights are terminated without a hearing, without evidentiary hearing, without evidence, it's just done. And it's done and over and you lose your kids and good luck okay that's the same thing as if the judge went up, up there and would shoot these people himself okay because there's a process to terminate parental rights there's a process to take away children from parents and that process wasn't followed yet the parental rights were terminated okay let's uh uh, we, uh, Dallas, we already did uh, MAC immunity. Uh, I, I think we, we already played that, didn't we? Yeah, okay. Um, but let's go to MAC after uh, uh, Michelle McDonald, her comments after the uh, case. I uh, have everything in writing. I presented the case as best I could. One, uh, I felt as if, uh, I don't know how to say this, that there was a lot of gobbledygook coming from, did, did anybody else feel that way? That there wasn't a lot of factual um, um, pieces coming from uh, David Knudsen's attorney, the attorney general. It was more uh, a spacious claim of judicial immunities and we're judges so we can uh, pretty much do whatever we, we would like to do. The, it, it went smoothly. I brought all my, my evidence together, but I was, what, what concerned me, if, if, if anything, is the judge asked in the middle of my argument for an Eighth Circuit case. So I'm just like, uh, we have a case here. So apparently we might have cases in other circuits that have identical facts to the Sandra Grazzini wrecking your five children versus uh, David Knudsen, but uh, we have to find <laughs> an identical case to this one in order to proceed. So I got the impression, did you, did you Tim, get that impression? And that's the, the only question threw me off. I'm like, uh, are you understanding? Go ahead, Dale. Michelle, I want you to know that you were eloquent Everyone in the room understood what you were saying, and they were all impressed. You did a great job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. So that's the only thing that threw me off, and then I started to worry that this particular United States federal court judge was not going to let the case go through, which I, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm very confident that it should absolutely positively 
I heard a lot of, uh, oh, she just wants a different divorce order. No. Different custody order. No. We don't, we're already in uh, the, the United States Supreme Court to, uh, to, to rid of mandamus. We have extraordinary relief. And, and she's saying, well, why don't you just appeal? And, uh, what? Yeah. So, so no, 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 no. You're not understanding that this. Just because you have, uh, if I, if I, if you're in jail and in the under the jurisdiction of the jail, it doesn't give you the right to violate civil rights. So too, if you're in a case, what? Get, I just can't just make orders to. What Remove somebody from their life, law? basically. Yeah, yeah it, I mean, M Michelle McDonald's comments there was exactly what I was thinking when this was taking place. Why is the judge asking this question about is there any prior cases? And it, wasn't, and it was worded in such a way, and that's why I really wanted a camera in there, because then you get the right wording of the question. Couldn't write it down fast enough. Um, what Eighth Circuit cases do you have that represent this case? And it's like all cases come before the Eighth Circuit that are the same? Or one had to come prior to this case? No. This is a unique case. And we're going to hear some other comments on that. But I had the same, why even ask that question? You're a judge. These are attorneys. You know the attorneys are to present some case law, but guess what? New case law gets made, and how many times has a judge been brought before federal, a district, state district court judge been brought before federal court in a 1983 class action lawsuit? Well, it has happened. The Supreme Court has ruled on these things, and it's ruled in favor of uh, Sandra Grazzini, not the judge. And so those do have precedence in this case. Uh, and other jurisdictions, federal court jurisdictions like, say, the Ninth or the First or the Fifth, have had cases of judicial misconduct uh, before them and have dealt with it. But to specifically the Eighth Circuit, as if you got to have one exactly like this, not going to happen. This is a different case, a different situation. So Judge Susan Nelson, an Obama appointee in her first year, who just had her, her first uh, appeal, appellate court case before the federal appellate courts, she just got rejected on that. And this is her first case, my understanding, first case back since she was rejected by the appellate courts. Um, a lot of dynamics going on here um, uh, in this case. And it did look like yeah, I want to make this clear. The judge's uh, decision, Susan Nelson's decision in a case was reversed by the Eighth Circuit federal courts. And as a judge, you don't like to be reversed, but it happened. Um, so, you know, in this case, if there's, if there's no case, if you got to already have a case before the Eighth, that's already been decided before the Earth's Eighth Circuit before you can bring a case before the Eighth Circuit uh, in order to get it heard and ruled in your favor. It just did, it didn't make any sense. It just, it just was weird. Uh, okay, let's uh, go to the next clip where they, where they talked about the issue of case law. Exactly. Are we all the same? No, we're, we're, we all have different DNA, <laughs> right? So every case has a different DNA. So to say, do you have a case in the Eighth Circuit that allows you to proceed? And, and it didn't even feel like it was about uh, a defense for judicial immunities all of a sudden. It's like, well, if you had a different case or factual uh, case maybe just maybe we, we it didn't even feel like even if uh, you can't get a, a, you can't no, the first of its kind yeah, yeah. how do you get case law if you haven't had a case yet come yeah. this is the first of its kind yeah. and Michelle's one of the first attorneys she is the only attorney to do it to do what she's done it flows from the yeah 
Well, there, there you go. <laughs> so the judge was, I don't know what she was doing uh, in, in thinking. Uh, the issue and importance of this case to move on, the, this is a motion by the judge David Knutson to have his case dismissed because he's immune. Okay, but the reason the case needs to go on is so that we can explore and discovery can be made in order to show that um, the judge is acting outside his jurisdiction, has violated due process rights, and needs to be held accountable. So let's watch the next clip on uh, discovery there. The, the, that's, that's my question, and that's why if we go forward, we can, we can uh, that's what Lake discover the, the... They filed three letters. Part of yeah. this is that we're well, asking for discovery. Yes. Well, it, this what is... Discovery of what, what mm -hmm. actually took place. Yeah, this is, we, we presented the case, and they're asking right away that it be dismissed. They have not answered our complaint. They have not uh, um, e e even denied it. So... Uh, or, or even the improper assignments, there ha hasn't been any response. They're not denying what he did. They're, they're just not saying, denying. they're not saying, no, he didn't do All that. They're yes, immunity. they're not, de they're not the denying. Above the law. Exactly. Above the they're not saying, oh, no, he didn't do that, and it's against the law. They're just saying he can do it. How mm -hmm. does a judge become a chief judge? Is that, mm -hmm. do the judges themselves decide who's going to be the mm -hmm. chief judge, and doesn't that rotate? That's my understanding. Uh, and the statute says that, that the judges meet and they decide on who's going to be the chief judge. But Chanutin is on the Board of Judicial Standards, so when she says go complain to the board, <laughs> we ha he's on the board. In fact, he's the chief head of the board. Well, and here's a critical part of this case, was they're arguing that uh, Sandra Grazzini Rocky hasn't gone down the proper avenues. Uh, to appeal this case. Well, she is appealing it. It's before the U.S. Supreme Court and a writ of Man Davis. She is going down that avenues and, and the proper avenues and complaining to the Board on Judicial Standards, and doing all those avenues, but that's all separate to the issue of how Judge David Knutson in Dakota County has behaved. And she has every right to go and sue a judge that is violating her constitutional rights and depriving her of her children and her home without the due process rights. She has every right to do that. Okay, and, and what the Attorney General's office is saying is, no, just immune. It doesn't matter the issue. It doesn't matter what they do. They're immune. All right, so let's go to an appropriate avenue here and, and see the, uh, that discussion. Well, because we have exhausted all other avenues. And I think what she was trying to say, which was inaccurate, is that we're asking the United States Federal District Court to change a custody order, and we're not. We're asking for damages um, because individually against defendant David Knudsen for violating constitutional and civil rights. It's a, it's a USC 1983 case. Right. So processes versus uh, content of the case. And um, that's what they're trying to ignore is the content of the case and the content of the judge's uh, behavior and what he did. And so uh, we're running out of time here. Let's get this last clip in. Uh, no apply. Uh, and, the and complaint, it's a civil complaint, uh, USC 1983. I think I didn't really understand that question either because they're asking that it be dismissed for failure to state a claim, which we've stated, because of, only because of the immunities. They're saying there's immunities, so you can't bring a case against judges, which there are immunities. Uh, to an extent. To an extent. But if the ju if it's not if it's a non-judicial act, like this one is, and if there's no jurisdiction as we have here, it's a civil rights violation when you do something in your uniform under color. That's color why of they law. call it color of law. 
And again, they're not denying what he did was illegal. They're, they're not denying what he did was illegal. They're just saying he can do it because he's a judge. And that's mm -hmm. what we're fighting for, it's the civil mm -hmm. rights. If he has a right to do this, we've gotten to this level, these judges, David Knutson has done what he's done because we've allowed the judges to get to this level. And that's what we need to stop. Because what's next? If they're capable of doing this, they're capable of doing anything. All right. Well, this is a landmark case. We're going to see if uh, Federal District Court uh, Judge Susan Richardson Nelson, uh, how she decides on this case, um, probably come out within a couple months. And, uh, of course, if she denies the discovery of the case moving forward, I'm sure there will be an appeal, um, and I guarantee you there will be an appeal in this case. This is just too important. we got to rein our judges in. We can't let them violate constitutional rights and say it's okay uh, and not hold them accountable. And, you know, we as the people need to stand up and start asking questions. And it would help if this whole issue would help and be helped if we had actual effective laws that dealt with judicial accountability in Minnesota. David Knudsen thinks he can do whatever he wants to do. So anyway, remember folks, we're, we're done for the night, but if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's gonna stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless, we'll see you next week. We got a bunch of pro-life videos and discussion. God bless. Sets on fire